The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Alex Fallon, Julie, summer has ended. Fallon felt first year was so traumatizing that she fled to the icy north, spent the summer in Alaska, probably just before her last final was graded. Yes. She, she didn't even bother to find out <laughs> how well she did, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we actually find out immediately. But Oh, okay. Well, mm -hmm. And Julie's been hanging out with me all summer, which I love. Alex, how did you spend what might be your last free summer? It was indeed my last free summer. Yeah. I went to Ecuador for eight weeks. Oh. So I did a global health trip with six other students from Carver. And we went down there and we were doing like a combination of learning medical Spanish and getting some clinical experiences. And so it was nice. fun. Mm -hmm. where, uh, did you so where, wh who did you stay with? We stayed with host families okay, there. Yeah. So some people were together with other students and they were like two of them with a host family, but it's just me and my host family. So was how was fun. that? It was good. It was kind of an older couple. They have four kids. And so three of the kids were still living at home or like right nearby. So they were over all the time and they have they have some grandkids now, too. And so there was a little four-year-old girl who lived, like, right next door. And she she just made my day every day. She was so cute. Was it culture shock? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 My host family did not speak any English. And so I definitely struggled at first trying to communicate and also, like, be okay with making mistakes as far as speaking the language would go. Because there were definitely things that I was not saying grammatically correct. And I knew that. But... You kind of just have to get over just yourself. Gotta go with it. Yeah. You have, you have no choice. Exactly. But yeah, there were definitely some like different cultural things that were just different and took some time to get used to. So. Well, now you're back and you're Mayor McCheese of your learning community. Yep. That's exciting for you. <laughs> I, okay. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Coat Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews by students for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcoat.com. Welcome back to the Shortcode Podcast, the show that gives you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that fire hose. It's a production of the University of Iowa, Carver College of Medicine. I'm Dave Vettler. With me today in the SCP studio. Her eyes are open wide and unblinking to see even the most annoying truths. It's M2, Alex Nig. My eyes are open so wide. Wide open. She <laughs> sees all there is to see within a limited electromagnetic spectrum. It's M2, Fallon Jung. Zzz. Okay. <laughs> Her retinas are finely tuned to screen out bullshit. It's PA2, Julie Wong. Yeah. And his eyeballs are very well suited to taking in the light of knowledge. It's M3, Jeff Goddard. They do what they do. But if I told you shortcuts that we're not alone? How would you react to that? Because we're also joined by a very special guest. He's a public health researcher, a surgeon, and a New York Times bestselling author, among plenty of other things. And he's got a new book coming out this September called Blind Spots, When Medicine Gets It Wrong and What It Means for Our Health. Dr. Marty McCary, welcome back to our show. So cool to be with you guys again. Thanks for having me. Before we begin our conversation, Shortcoats, if you hear something today that sparks a thought, go to theshortcoat.com slash tell us and let us know. Kirsten, K-R-S-T-N, as she called herself, did that recently to tell me a story about studying the anatomy of naughty bits on a plane and her realization that her seatmate was kind of concerned about that. <laughs> Personally, I think you should have asked your neighbor if he or she would serve as a live specimen. <laughs> Kirsten, wow. you should. I mean... It can't hurt to ask, I feel like. Maybe it, it can. can. I think it, it can. can. It can. Oh, okay, you guys it think that I'm <laughs> yes. incorrect about that? Fair enough. But anyway, thanks for writing and telling me your story. I appreciate that. So, Dr. McCary, your book is, as usual, an accessible, very accessible look at one of the, uh, one of the problems with medicine. This time, it's about medical groupthink. So, for short quotes that aren't familiar with that term, what, would you, what is that? What's your definition? Groupthink is just going along with the herd mentality, and it results in medical dogma. And it turns out that most of the decisions we make as doctors don't have good scientific evidence to support them. It doesn't mean what we're doing is wrong. It just means 
that it's discretionary, that we have to use our best judgment and wisdom and the little literature that may exist on the topic. But when we make big decisions based on opinions in medicine, turns out we don't have a great track record. We get a lot of things wrong. Opioids were not addictive, ignited the opioid epidemic, telling young, young kids to avoid peanut butter altogether, ignored the concept of immune tolerance, igniting the modern day peanut allergy epidemic, and on and on. So we can develop blind spots. And in part, it's a product of our hyper specialization. The fact that the medical culture has done really a terrible thing to physicians and students. And that is, it's basically said, don't ask the big questions, put your head down and try to focus on one thing. And if you're really going to make it far in the academic pedigree, you're going to focus on one tiny little thing. And what we've done is put doctors on this throughput treadmill of billing and coding and increasing throughput. We even measure the product productivity by these units called RVU, work value units. And so we don't ask the big questions. And as a result, we've developed massive blind spots in medicine. And young people and doctors are now saying, hey, we got to start talking about our blind spots, the microbiome, food is medicine, school lunch programs, environmental exposures that cause cancer, not just the chemotherapy to treat it. We've got to start talking about these new things. And so that's why I wrote this book. We have blind spots and there's a lot of activity now to address them. So I got to read the full book. Oh. Everybody here got to read some of the book, but, but I got to read the full book. And full disclosure, fangirling a little bit. I've read all of your books and I've, I've followed you for years. So I'm a, bit, I'm a big fan. I'm still going to try to be tough because that's that's trying to be fair, but I'm definitely a big fan. My, my first question is, as a student, the frustrations that I've had is, you know, I, I try to stay up to date on, on knowledge as things are coming out. I listen to podcasts that, you know, I've, I've listened to, to you on a, a number of podcasts. I listen to the Sensible Medicine podcast and, and Dr. Prasad's podcast. So I'm trying to like follow as new things are coming along. And I feel like I just get punished for it in medical school in the sense that like, you know, I'll go into an exam and I'm like, well, actually, I know that there's this there's this new nuance that 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 we have, <laughs> but the text question was written based on knowledge from five ten years ago, mm. and so you know I'm losing points because I'm paying attention. And so like, how, what what would you say to to people that are in their training who are who are just hungry for the nuance and, and the new knowledge coming forth and and trying to learn new things that are stuck with the fact that the only way they're going to make it through the system is by answering questions that people had, you know, 10, 15 years ago on these board board exams. Gosh, uh, Jeff, I relate so much. I mean, I can tell you that in medical school as a student, I was being examined and tested on the low fat diet, you know, having to sort of recite a catechism that it reduces the risk of heart disease. And I knew it was not supported by any data. And the data now are overwhelming. It's not the natural saturated fats. It's the refined carbohydrates and ultra processed foods that we've ignored. It's the fact that we denature flour and basically turn it into sugar and it's everywhere. And that causes inflammation. It's not just the lipoproteins, it's general body inflammation. But I had to put my head down, tell them what I perceived they wanted to hear, answer the test and get done. I had to do that in order to get into to finish, get to the finish line. And I ended up doing a surgical residency and then a fellowship and go to the, as far as you can go in academics, you know, focus on one tiny little thing, just the pancreas and uh, get all the accolades and the tenure. And I'm here to tell you that there is hope at the end of, end of the tunnel. There are a number of people now saying we've got to get off this hamster wheel where we glorify and worship things that are don't matter, okay? It doesn't matter if we submit a tiny little research abstract at a national conference, okay? It doesn't matter if you get a big title at an academic institution. What matters is if you're improving the health of the population. So just a little bit of encouragement, keep plugging along. It's good for people to hear different scientific opinions. That's the scientific process. None of us have, uh, trademark on truth, despite what some may tell you about certain opinions. We need open civil discourse. We need that open dialogue. You know, when I was a kid, I grew up in central Pennsylvania in the gold, coal mine regions. Did I say gold mine? I wish <laughs> <laughs> coal mine regions. 
And they burned a certain sort of clean, efficient coal called anthracite coal. Well, on the way to the mall, I noticed there was smoke coming out of the ground and it wasn't just in one spot. It's all over the area called Catawissa. And I asked my mom, why is there smoke coming out of the ground? And she said, oh, that's the Centralia mine fire. It goes miles and miles and miles. They're never going to put it out. It's going to burn for hundreds of years. And that's what the smoke's from. And I was like, okay, I guess everyone grows up next to a mine fire. I mean, I didn't know the difference. It's amazing how dad... it, it's amazing how humans could get used to a fact, you know, like get used to right. I guess we're living next you don't know what's normal. Now. So my dad is a hematologist at Geisinger Hospital in Pennsylvania. And he sees tons of a rare kind of leukemia that he is certain is related to the Centralia mine fire. Toxic smoke coming up out of the ground for decades. Now I thought when I get to med school, someone's going to prove this to be a, a fab. You know, any day now, there's going to be a big study. And I realized no one's working on it. No one's asking the question. No one's looking into this. First day of med school, I remember looking at a picture of a lung from the anatomy lab. You know, I was preparing for the anatomy lab. And then I got there and I saw the lung in someone was black. Have you seen that? Just total black lung. They say it's from city dwellers. Yeah, And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's this? You know, is this is scary? What the hell is going on here? The lung is black. And they say, oh, that's just normal. It's common in city dwellers. And it's it it's not harmful. Mm. What? How do you conclude that so quick, right? Who's <laughs> asking the big questions? Well, how, how much of this is because, you know, we don't have all the answers and so we feel like we have to have all the answers feel feel like we just dismiss these important questions it, it you're right david it would take a lot of resources energy money focus the national institutes of health public health researchers if my dad wanted to do a study showing that these toxic fumes cause this type of leukemia who's going to pay for that pharma mm -hmm. his own department that's on a treadmill to make money um the American Academy of, you know, whatever the professional association is. So we have this Bermuda Triangle where we ask, we naturally ask big questions because we're intellectually curious. People attracted to medical school are creative, right, altruistic. Heck, 90% of our applicants want to do medical missions, if not full-time, as a small part of their career on the side in some way. And then we, it's almost like we say, put your head down, memorize the Krebs cycle 15 times regurgitated on an exam, don't ask the big questions, there's no research there. And it, we're what we're doing is we are conditioning people. And the folks who are smart and who succeed and are gonna do big things in life are those who say, I'm saving those big questions. I specialize in pancreas cancer at Johns Hopkins. We do more pancreas cancer than any center in the world. We're the best, I guess, You know, the experts. And I asked once in our multidisciplinary conference, does anyone know why pancreas cancer has doubled in the last two decades? It's like no one had ever thought of it. No one had considered it. So we can't just play whack-a-mole on the back end of disease. We've got to start looking at pesticides, environmental exposures, the food, ultra-processed, seed oils, all of the stuff that has lived in the blind spot of medicine if we're truly going to improve the health of the population because industry is feeding us this stuff. They're poisoning the water supply, the food supply. And we're supposed to just on the back end, take care of patients when they get to these late stages. No, we're not going to do this anymore. So a generation now is saying we want to ask the big questions. So I guess a question and everybody else feel free to jump in. I just, I've, I've got a lot of thoughts. Well, one question I, I've been thinking about a lot when I was reading the book, a lot of the things that you just mentioned, maybe would you say that there's there's a natural hesitancy to tackling these questions because of the voices that are already talking about things in this space? So like, for example, we talked about, you know, microbiome and how it might affect intellectual development, right? That's really close to sounding like Andrew Wakefield's paper. And nobody in medicine wants to be associated with Andrew Wakefield at this point, I think with good reason, right? And so there's a natural hesitancy to even approach that because nobody wants to sound like Andrew Wakefield. Does that Does that make sense? Like, are, are we circling the wagons because we're extra defensive because we want to make sure that we're not associated with people that, that have done some actual harm, but like 
also can't be taken seriously at this point. And I, we want to be serious. We but, want to be taken serious. And before you answer, I just want to remind our listeners who may not know who Andrew Wakefield is. He's the guy who basically said Vaccine, vaccines, vaccines cause, cause autism. autism. Yeah. Uh, and and his you. link was he was a GI doctor. And so his link was it has something to do with gut development. And that's what caused autism, right? And it, but his paper was it, it was it was just garbage research, right? Yeah. And but it is what thoroughly it is. discredited now. But people, yeah. yeah, whether or not the 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 thesis could have been correct, whether there was plausibility, the science that he actually conducted was not good, right? Yeah. So so everybody just kind of threw him out. I think that's fair. Yeah, and there was some fraud with that research. Yeah. Good point. But to answer your question, Jeff, yes, we're sometimes we're so busy playing footsie, trying not to associate or be uh, aligned, you know, or so we don't want to be adjacent to. A- an idea that we're afraid to explore it. Uh, classic example, big study just came out on um, a psychedelic medication for severe mood disorders and PTSD. Now, they showed a small benefit, but the study appeared to have ethical problems. There were some unethical issues with the with the study. Now, does that mean we ignore the, the potential role of this medication entirely because someone who did a study did something unethical in the study. It, the purpose of science is to challenge deeply held assumptions. And if we're going to f- succumb to the modern day McCarthyism of, you know, well, that's close to this guy and you liked this post on Twitter and we're not going to cure cancer or advanced discovery. And if you look at what the medical establishment has done with all their games, we're not in a good spot. 75% of Americans are obese or overweight on the way to diabetes. 25% already have prediabetes. One in three kids born today will develop diabetes. That's the world that we've ushered into these kids. And sometimes when we put kids on these highly addictive substances or they're just nor- nervous before an exam, we assign mental illness diagnoses to them when, when sometimes it's the medicalization of ordinary life. And so what we're seeing now is a whole, our nation's children being converted into a generation of patients and no one's willing to stop and say, why are they obese? What's causing general body inflammation? Why are they anxious? And I experienced a little bit of what you're talking about, Jeff, with questioning the data on the COVID vaccine booster in young, healthy individuals who have already recovered from COVID. Now, the data is very clear that we were right on this. Natural immunity is big review study in the Lancet as effective, if not more than the vaccine. But you couldn't have this conversation because you quickly would get labeled an anti-vaxxer. And once you get that, you know, then everyone runs for the hills. But the, if you look at the sort of the fact that there was no randomized control trial of the vaccine booster, or the fact that the two top vaccine experts at the FDA were fired because they protested the approval of the vaccine booster in young, healthy uh, people. And when we looked at the vaccine mandate for the booster in particular, it's as if you couldn't have the conversation because it was just, are you pro or anti-vaccine as if it was some religion? So I think we got to stand up. People are afraid to speak up. Unfortunately, there's pressure, there's nudges put on people to not speak up. But, you know, the the truth in medical science doesn't change if you want it to change. Eventually, it'll come out. Yeah. We, and on, on that, that last subject, we have had Paul Offit on, on the podcast, which he's, it would be, it, you'd be hard pressed to find somebody who's more pro vaccine over the course of their career. The, the, the <laughs> amount of work that that man has done. And we had the same conversation, right? That, that the, how much pushback was received from somebody who has spent his entire life trying to get kids vaccinated with, well, maybe this booster isn't the most efficacious thing for for this population. And then, yeah, yeah. He, he didn't give it to his kid, the vaccine yeah. booster. Yeah. yeah. I do want to ask about certain situations because it's not that, I feel that there are still providers who definitely are asking questions and are noticing trends, but they're just not able to get the study started. I know that in the last year, I tried to find providers to work with for an ag novel research. And there's one who I met who had like, had seen a trend But the only reason that she couldn't continue research is because she had trouble getting funding for it, even though the data was there, it was ready to be analyzed, it was ready to be compiled, and the only thing stopping was whether or not she had, like, other support. So how would a provider get around that kind of issue if they have a question? Well, great point, Julie. Yeah, said the same thing So I remember as between my second and third year med school, I took 
I printed out my resume, which had almost nothing on it. You know, it's like, what do you, when we had put like key club in high school on there, I really did nothing. <laughs> I didn't play any sports, but I took whatever my contact information was and a very thin resume and walked through the hospital and stopped by all these offices of doctors and just said, is there any research you're doing? This was at Mass General Hospital that I could participate in. And uh, one of them called me back and did some interesting stuff. Now, it wasn't as interesting as I wanted uh, a study out to be, but at least it was something. And I remember there was one guy who said, you know, we've demonized cholesterol, but cholesterol may not be the devil we say it is. Now we know dietary cholesterol is a sterified. It doesn't even get absorbed. 90% doesn't get absorbed. Why are we pushing low cholesterol foods? I mean, it's just this great irony, right? The number one health recommendation we gave to patients for 60 years was to avoid fat. We'd say, eat better and exercise more. And here's how you eat better, avoid fat. It was wrong, right? It was misinformation. Uh, and the government spread that misinformation in their food pyramid. So how can you actually challenge the deeply held assumptions? It can be hard as a student. Now, there's a group of doctors who are doing it. And sometimes you can find out who they are. Sometimes it's in the functional medicine space. We don't know what to call this, right? If you want to talk about these blind spots in medicine, what is that? Is that naturopathic? Not really, but it includes some of that. Is it holistic medicine? Not really. It's not really the term, but it includes some of that. Is it functional medicine? Not really, but it includes that. And so is it family medicine? Is it primary care? Is it preventive medicine? Well, preventive medicine has sometimes now been captured by the industry just to push more mammograms and diagnostic testing in the community. It's not really about food and talking about, can we treat more diabetes with cooking classes instead of just throwing insulin at people? Can we treat high blood pressure by talking about the quality of their sleep? Because when they don't sleep well, they increase their vascular muscle tone. And instead of just throwing antihypertensives and memorizing first line, second line. In school, we kind of teach this, we do this terrible thing of just memorize all these drug names and learn the, the indications. And then you develop this reflex when you come out. And so a group of doctors are saying, do it differently. So I would encourage you, you know, the field is changing. We're starting to make major progress. Jeff, you mentioned sensible medicine. We're I've got our own Substack now and some other Peter Atia, the podcasters are out there. You guys are talking about stuff. So I think good stuff is happening. I'm just not sure what the recipe is for a student, except if you know that you want to be a part of something bigger, you don't just want to see patients in 10, 15 minute visits from eight to five every day with one administrative day. If you look at the attending physician saying they were spent their Saturday billing and coding and writing their notes. And you say, I don't want to have anything to do with that. You're in good company. And that's an indicator that you're going to be a great physician. Because a, a lot of folks now are saying, I want to be an entrepreneur and a doctor so I can disrupt the industry. I want to spend time with people. I want to understand these blind spots, the microbiome and what's going on in the food world. So we are seeing some interesting uh, things that are happening now. There's some good movement. So I, I just want to, I'm going to, a roundabout, sorry about this, Julie, but just kind of a roundabout story. So it's something that I heard on, I I, I want to say Dr. Demania's podcast recently, but it kind of reminded me of an experience I had in medical school. My first year where this guy came and he was talking about the research that he was doing in Niger. And he said, you know, we, we've proven that Pediatric patients in these rural poor areas have worse outcomes with HIV and tuberculosis than affluent kids in urban areas. And I thought to myself, like, that's the dumbest, like, of all the parachute studies that's ever been done, why didn't you spend that money that you that you use to get medical students to Niger to collect all this? Why didn't you just give them sandwiches? You know, like, it seemed like kind of an obvious thing. But those types of studies, these, like, I don't know, health disparity studies, those that, that seems to be, like, the, the phrase du jour to get funding from, like, the NIH or something like that to get these grants. To Julie's point, what do you do when you're trying to study something where you just can't get grants because there's there's a specific type of research that they want to fund and, and you're just not asking those types of questions. You're trying to ask things that are out of the box and nobody wants to fund you. What what do you do? I'm starting to think of Netflix documentary. Yeah. <laughs> it's tough, right? Because when they control eighty billion dollars at the NIH and they say we're gonna we really want to fund health disparities. And a lot of us have said, look, describing health disparities is not interesting research. I'm sorry. Fixing health disparities is very interesting. 
but all the research is on descriptive. So we kind of make ourselves feel good that we're addressing these when we're really not, we're describing them. One in six NIH grants goes to health disparities or health equity research. We just did that study. And uh, um, there's a role for all kinds of research, but we're pouring raw sewage into the Potomac River here in Washington, D.C. when it rains. We are pouring billions of gallons of uh, glycophate and other pesticides that have estrogen binding like properties as the average age of puberty is decreasing every year. We have the earliest age of puberty of any country in the world in the United States, and we have the highest rate of these environmental exposures. Microplastics have estrogen binding properties and the immune system may be rejecting them, adding to general body inflammation at the lining of the GI tract. No one's talking about these things and no one at the NIH is funding these things, but we know there's a signal in the data that we have an obligation to address if we're really going to address health. The NIH has the H in it and that's supposed to stand for health. Not, you know, it's not NIP for pharma. And the F in FDA stands for food. So we've allowed the industry to capture some of our regulatory bodies and control medical research. We've had giant grants from pharma to every major academic medical center. And that's fine if they're unrestricted, but we cannot ignore what our patients need. And right now, if you look at the data, they are crying out. People are suffering from chronic diseases and we're, we don't or we're not doing a good job. Acute care, we're doing great. You get shot, you get stabbed, you come to Johns Hopkins Hospital or any one of our nation's leading hospitals, you will get an incredible tour de force of medical care and you'll have the highest chance of, being, of your life being saved. But you come in with chronic abdominal pain or some kind of food allergy and it's like it doesn't fit our billing throughput system. We don't know what to do. People fall through the cracks. So I would encourage you to keep your enthusiasm around these big issues because there is there is new interest in it now. And there's private philanthropists who are funding this kind of work. Actually, we have no NIH funding in my big research center. We're funded privately by individuals in America who hear us talk about these problems. They say, yes, that's what we need to focus on. And they donate money to us. So, so we don't need to fill out those NIH grant forms or deal with the government. I feel like uh, there's there's a lot of the stories that you talk about in your book, I'm thinking of, well, I, I mean, a lot of the stories that you talk about in your book of researchers who are successful in in talking about these things and in, in changing how we look at health and disease and medicine, a lot of it comes down to persistence. You know, just an almost a single-minded persistence of like, you know, I see what's happening here. I'm going to... You know, I'm going to push people and push people and push people until finally someone says, hey, you know what? That's a good idea. I feel like that's the, you know, unfortunately, the formula for medical students who see these problems, too, is to just keep that in the back of your head. And when you're finally in a position to, you know, start being persistent about these things to just go for it. But, yeah. you know, when you're learning, when when you're, you know, an, an M2, it's going to be hard hard to it's gonna be hard to push those ideas you know so how about here's a here's a i think a relevant question for us as learners who are trying like with all sincerity going in eyes wide open trying to give these the benefit to the of the doubt to these new ideas that are coming toward us how do we and how do our listeners the people that are trying to 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 grow up in medicine now how do we separate the 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 mavericks that have these wonderful ideas from the charlatans that are you know just trying to take advantage of whoever they can pick off right so the the example and I, and I forgot the doctor's name and I feel bad about it but I remember studying about the H pylori uh, discovery oh. when I was in my undergrad I didn't realize that was in the 80s like I'm embarrassed that that was so recent that lots that of the stories that you tell in the book are like very recent mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that was somebody that like he was a maverick yeah but we definitely should have been listening to him and then, and sorry to keep dumping on Andrew Wakefield, but I mean, if he would stop, I would stop. But you know, you, you got somebody like that who is persistently trying to push his narrative that is wrong. But then, you know, so like, I don't know, like, how do you, how do you see these people that are on kind of, let's say the fringe of medicine who maybe they have a really great idea and that's going to revolutionize this, the field, or, you know, maybe they're going to cause people to do something really not safe with their health. I don't know. How do you, how do you differentiate those? Like, do you... Yeah, what's your process for that? 
we just have to use consistent scientific standards. Right now, medicine has become so politicized, and I'm not even talking about any one agenda. I'm just talking about if people want to believe something, then they say, oh, this is a great study, even though it's methodologically flawed. And if a study goes against what they already believe, then they dismiss it or don't talk about it or it's inconvenient and they'll Curtis find some way to nitpick it. And so you got to use the same scientific standards and trust the scientific process. We, we didn't really, we haven't done a good job of that. Look for doctors who challenge deeply held assumptions and who are still legitimate using the scientific basis, or they have decent credentials. And there's a lot of them. One of my colleagues likes to take out the appendix for appendicitis. He does it a lot. And I, we all did it. We did it 100% of the time. You come in with appendicitis, you take them to surgery, you do the operation. Some of you have watched these procedures. It's very sort of surgery 101. But then a big randomized control trial came out showing you don't need to operate on every appendicitis. Two thirds can get by with just a short course of antibiotics, which, which they're on anyway when they're waiting for surgery. And we've noticed when we roll p people back for surgery, some of them are already cured. They're already better. But, you know, we just did it anyway. Well, the studies <laughs> show you don't have to operate on everybody. I showed it to my colleague and he says, well, I need to see two randomized control trials. Then a second trial comes out. Well, I need to see three randomized control trials. Then the third trial came out. All top journals, top studies, long-term follow-up. He says, well, I just still think you're better with your appendix out. I, it's like... <laughs> Can I just say that I had a very visceral reaction to this to this anecdote because <laughs> I didn't get to go to Disney World when I was a child because my mother had needed her appendix out. And I still to this day my inner child is pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. That's an example of not using basic scientific standards. We should use the same standards for every study if it shows that you know, ivermectin doesn't work, or if it shows that the fifth vaccine booster in a young, healthy 12-year-old girl doesn't work. We have to apply the same, regardless of what we want the data to show, we've got to be objective. And I think one of the things we've lost in modern medicine today, as we've taken on this sort of groupthink herd mentality, is the ability to critically appraise scientific studies. Yeah, And that's why I encourage all my med students to do some advanced epidemiology, learn those methods so you can really understand how to pick apart a study and figure out what's total fluff and empty and what's an actual signal in the data. The um, Mayo Clinic just put out an, an amazing study I talk about in the book, Blind Spots. Amazing. I can't believe doctors don't even know about this study. It's on the microbiome. So what they did is they looked at the kids who took an antibiotic in the first couple of years of life. We know antibiotics carpet bomb the microbiome and alter its balance and composition. Well known. Well, the kids who took an, an antibiotic compared to kids who did not in the first few years of life had higher rates of obesity, learning disabilities, asthma, and celiac. Like three, nearly 300% higher rates of celiac. When people come in and say, I have celiac, what caused it? We've told them we don't know, or we make something up. Turns out now, this is a very strong signal in the data. And the more courses of antibiotics a child took, the greater the risk of all of these conditions. That's a These are all chronic diseases that are going up. And by the way, farmers have noticed this for decades. That's why they routinely give their animals antibiotics to fatten them up. And so this guy at NYU was smart enough to say, hey, if, if antibiotics make animals fatter, what's it doing to children? And sure enough, the data was there. Now, the Mayo Clinic published it in their own little Mayo Clinic proceedings, even though it was an elegant, amazing study with 14,000 kids addressing the biggest health issues of our day. Why was it published in the Mayo Clinic proceedings? because it lives in a blind spot of medicine. It didn't fit one of the specialties. What specialty is the microbiome? What specialty is general body inflammation mm, yeah. or mm, insulin resistance, yeah. which is essentially high insulin levels? Um, is it GI, is it infectious diseases, is it? And so we don't know what to do, right? And the, that's the problem is we've put the medical professionals on this 
one hammer whack-a-mole job on the conveyor belt at the very end of a health journey with just the two tools of prescribing or operating when they want to address the root causes, but we don't give them the time or resources to do it. So a lot of students are telling me now, Marty, I want a hybrid career. And that's what I encourage them to do. They want to be a doc and they want to practice, but they want to do something deeper. They want to work with a company that's, say, manufacturing or uh, generating probiotics. A study just found probiotics were used to successfully treat bipolar. The study just came out showing that the rise in colon cancer in young people is associated with people being born by C-section, which we know alters the microbiome. No one talks about it. We just, you'll see it in your OB rotations. Yeah, well, how would, you know, would you like to deliver vaginally or a C-section? Your choice doesn't make a difference. What's going on here? The microbiome, the, the baby's gut is sterile in utero. And the microbiome is formed, the millions of different bacteria in the microbiome involved in digestion and the immune system, and it makes serotonin. So it's involved in mood and it's so instrumental. It's the central organ of the body. It's formed from the bacteria in the birth canal as the baby is born vaginally. And it's augmented from breast milk and skin and kisses from grandparents and all sorts of stuff. But when a baby is born by C-section, a sterile baby is extracted from a sterile operative field. And what may seed the microbiome are the bacteria that normally live in the hospital. And it's a very different microbiome. No one's talking about this. And yet in my field of general surgery, we, talk, we spend hundreds of hours talking about how to cut out colon cancer. And never once do we stop and ask, why is colon cancer going up? What's causing this? And it's not because doctors are bad people. They're good people. They're working in a bad system that we inherited where we're supposed to get on the treadmill and just put our heads down and do our job. And we're saying no more. We have, It's time to get into these root problems. I will say that one has a hits a little close to home. I, I have a child who was born seven weeks ago and uh, it was in New York. And um, I just I, I felt like the obstetrics team was just it just felt like they were using a little bit of emotional manipulation and just really pushing for that C-section. And I felt really uncomfortable. We ended up having the C-section and, and the aftercare was not great. And I was pretty grumpy about the whole thing. And turns out New York has like double the C-section rate as Iowa, where, where we are right now. And uh, the hospital that was in was even higher than that was on the high end of that. And I'm like, you know, if she'd just been born in, if, if we had just been in a different hospital, we would have had different outcomes, you know? And it was a pretty traumatic experience for my spouse obviously not great for our child if, if that was unnecessary, which I, I don't know that it was. And uh, But here we are, you know, just kind of having to make do with, with the situation because this is a, a hospital that has a certain policy that has a certain approach to these things. And Yeah. And if you can't protect yourself knowing what you know and feeling how uncomfortable you felt yeah. with mm -hmm. that, you know, I mean, the, what, the what attendant chances... sitting here kind of making me feel like a bad person for, for yeah. not thinking this is a good thing. And I'm for like, bringing it up. Yeah. Like I, I, I know the data, like I, mm -hmm. I have to study this, right? Like I'm, I'm in my OB rotation right now. I'm actually studying this stuff and I'm, and I'm like, I don't think she, she's right, but you know, she's the attending. So I've got to kind of defer a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. So yeah. actually I do have a question on a more micro level. So for us that are going into clinicals, you know, starting in January, I was reading that, that little anecdote about doing, uh, what do you call those circumcisions without any sort of anesthetic hmm. and I mean, like I've experienced that myself working in a hospital, they kind of just like give babies glucose and then they're like, oh, like they're going to be good. They'll never remember it. And I wonder as a student, like if somebody's doing that, is there anything that you can do that's not going so far out of like the hierarchical you know, realm of normalcy? Because I mean, like it is sort of an, an ethical question, right? Like, is it okay that we're taking babies back without their parents seeing and, you know, allowing them to be in pain just because they won't remember it. I mean, I, I mean, with my child, I specifically asked for, for the lidocaine. Fortunately, so I did my rotations in a different city, but through the, through the university, but the hospital in, in Des Moines, they do lidocaine for, for circumcisions. Yeah. But I was in, in Florida when, yeah. when we were mm -hmm. doing that, but what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, Fallon, I look, I love, your question. I love it, love it, love it. And you need to hold on to it. And my dad, when I had those same observations said, write those down because you'll be amazed how quickly you can forget them. These are the questions we need to hold on to and ask. These are the sort of 
observational objections that come as an instinct. And as you said, Jeff, it could be that the C-section was necessary. Maybe I don't know enough. That's okay. But the instinctive observations that, hey, their kid's in pain, their heart rate's going up, their blood pressure's going up, they're crying just because they don't remember it doesn't make it ethical. This is the conversation we need to have. And it's only because people are talking about this stuff that we saw the movement to say, we need to do this more ethically. Remember that sort of objection I observed growing up near the coal mine? Yeah. You know, like, hey, there's got to be an association here. Like somebody put this together. Like somebody, you know, I can't do it. I don't know enough, but somebody needs to do it. When enough people say something, that's when we see movement. And so we we're st- look at the um, way that we've assaulted babies, and we're still doing it in some parts of the country. The treatment of human beings when they enter the world is barbaric sometimes. Now, it's better. The field has matured. We used to routinely in the 1950s and into the 60s separate babies, normal, normal babies, that term, for up to 10 days from their mother. They needed to be breastfeeding. Okay, we created these myths that there's no difference in the health of the baby if you breastfeed or, or formula feed, and we let the formula companies control the narratives. We put temperature probes in the baby's butt when I was uh, a student. Why? You know, we cut the tra- the umbilical cord too early. We now know from research it's good to let it pulse. It's pulsing stem cells and fetal hemoglobin and antibodies and all warm blood. It's warming. Why are we whisk the baby off? To a, under a French fry light just to rewarm the baby when they're already getting a warm transfusion. And the mom should be holding the baby skin to skin for hours. And they're more likely to breastfeed if they start in the golden hour. So we're recognizing now these are the best practices. And what we were doing was the medicalization of ordinary life. And so enough people would ask, enough patients would ask to have their cord cut in a delayed fashion. And when there's enough conversation that's when we see markets move. And I, I feel like a lot of the things that you just described are around birth were, were due to the the convenience of the hospital or the practitioners mm-hmm. and not for the benefit of the baby. So, you you know, you, or the or the parents, you know, you just sort of have to watch out for that sort of thing. Like, yeah, that one statement saying that, oh, there's no difference between a vaginal or a C-section birth, but you're actually doing open surgery on the mother in order to get the baby out. Yeah saying there's no difference. I mean, that just seems like crazy talk when you put it that way. (laughs) Well, and I think that goes back to one of the points that's made in the book of this cognitive dissonance. Mm -hmm. Like you come to accept things and sometimes the way you do that is, you know, if if you are a provider taking care of those babies, like maybe you perceive the situation as better for everybody, but really it's just because you're in a better state of mind. Like Mm -hmm. maybe you have more time to go do something. Mm -hmm. And so even though it may not necessarily be better for the baby, it was better for you. And you, your mind kind of gets mixed up in that scenario Mm -hmm. of trying to like justify it. And so it's like, you're not looking at actual evidence here, but we do have such a natural tendency to try and like make our minds be okay with the decisions that we're making. Yeah. And so I, I feel like that's kind of what happened there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel like if you're if you're a student in these situations and you feel you feel something about what you're seeing, that's probably a good indication that you need to pay, pay attention to that feeling mm-hmm. and really think about it and then maybe go do some research on it. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, think about whatever research you're looking at whether it's good research or not, which is probably a talent all on its own that you need to, mm-hmm. that that you need to develop because as you pointed out you know a lot of research kind of sucks it's not yeah it's not great most of it mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> i i listen to a podcast i'm just blindly giving in feel free to 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 sponsor us everybody i i listen to there's, there's room this, enough for there's there's room in podcast land for all of us fair enough i i listen to this podcast a plenary session it's a it's this oncologist at dr prasad that um marty knows and I'll be honest, I have no interest in going into oncology, like at all at this point in my in my life. I, it's an interesting field, but it's just not what I want to be spending my time doing. But I love to listen to him pick apart studies because it helps me develop these skills. Right. You know, it helps me, you know, focus on the things that are most important. Like 
before I didn't really understand the concept, what does it really mean to be underpowered or, or, or overpowered, right, in a study? Or the ethical implications of doing research in, in a country that, in the long run, isn't going to be able to have access to this medical intervention anyway, right? So, like, these are the questions that I can ask now because I, I'm paying attention to people that are already asking the questions. So. Well, how much formal education do you guys get in Negligible. understanding what's a good study and what's Ooh, They a do bad teach study. us, like, statistics. Yeah, so yeah. there's... We as part of the curriculum, <laughs> yeah, as part of the curriculum, we have a little um, part of one of our classes, and it's called evidence-based clinical practice. And so, in that, you're supposed to learn kind of how to analyze data, the general statistics that studies will use, and how to analyze those things and then use them clinically. So I feel like we got more into it just this last spring, and I'm hoping that we'll continue to discuss it. I know we have some more sessions, but I think there's definitely not enough and I don't think there's as much like actual practice that we get out evaluating those things. It's kind of like, okay, here's a little snippet of something and here's some easy numbers that you can do it with. Like we're not actually practicing it with real studies. Well, that's, I mean, I feel like that's hard. a lot of med school, isn't it? I mean, you're, yeah. you're, you're here it's sort of a familiarization on medicine. It's not really, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very, you know, uh, maybe of necessity a bit shallow. To, to be fair though, speaking to the, I think the first chapter of blind spots, we do know that a confidence interval can't include the number one. So, you know, <laughs> we've got that going for us. I don't know. I, I read that chapter and I, I was kind of laughing to myself a little bit. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. We learned talking about hormone replacement there. <laughs> yeah. Of yeah. Cancer dogma. Yeah. Yeah. So, we do we know some things but we could definitely use a little bit more practice yeah yeah especially with like addressing cognitive dissonance because there's one thing to have the data as you said we had so many studies in order to convince your colleague that hey maybe you don't need to take the appendix out and he just kept on fighting back and giving pushback and eventually was like dismissive but sometimes like there's just people who have some sort of like underlying like I'm sorry, I'm kind of all over the place, but there's often like a reason, if not from data, that they're pushing back on this. And sometimes with the questioning and with communication of this data, you have to somewhat appeal to their to their pathos in terms of like, what is their reasoning for continuing this? Is it because they think it's for the money or because they think that they can't have been wrong in the past or all this time? I mean, and there's a lot of like really sort of personal reasons yeah. Yeah. that you, in, in order for, you know, Dr. Mm -hmm. McCary to address this with his colleague, he'd have to like really sort of get into these things that would feel a bit insulting and would sort of, <laughs> you know, like cause more pushback. Yeah. So like than... it has to be very careful in how you introduce like new ideas, because I know that when I feel like someone who is in a higher position than me is wrong about something. Oftentimes I take on a little bit of a, I don't know if this is manipulative, but I try to look sub submissive and be like, oh, wouldn't you think that this situation and then, you know, let them come to the conclusion. As best you can. To, yeah. yeah. And then, it, you know, it's their idea. I'm just asking a question as a curious student <laughs> or like, I'm just so, you know, what unsure know? of these things. Yeah. But actually when I look at this data altogether, do you think that maybe this could be, and then just they play in the game? I, they get I don't to know. Just have to play the game. I don't know, Marty. You can you can tell me if you, if you think this is off, but my personal experience is that there is there are few motivators quite as powerful as the combination of I'm doing good, and I'm making money. Mm -hmm. If you tell a doctor that the thing that they're doing that is making them money and they think is doing good is actually not doing good, whew, you're in, you're in for some cognitive dissonance right there. Mm -hmm. you're, you're you're in for a hard conversation. And at the very end, just like threaten them a little bit. Like, what happens if you're actually wrong? And then you like everyone finds out that you actually continue doing this after everyone like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can bully them into doing the right thing. That'll that'll do it. Just a little bit of like. <laughs> yeah. oh, goodness. You guys are spot on. I love it. I mean, this is the intellectual curiosity that leads to great things in medicine. And so as long as we're talking about this stuff, we're gonna keep pushing the field. The father of modern medicine, this guy, Dr. Claude Bernard in the late 1800s, implored all of us to recognize that we all have our biases. It's natural, it's part of the human condition, we can't avoid it. 
But we need to recognize our biases when we hear new information and then temporarily suspend those biases so we can consider new information as objectively as possible. And it's not just a, le a lesson for medicine and its modern group think, but it's also probably a broader lesson for society, how we think about politics and business and relationships. We all have our biases. We all tend to believe what we hear first, not because it's more logical or more scientifically sound than new information, but simply because we hear it first. And Leon Festinger, you alluded, Alex, to the section on why we resist new ideas, the psychology of groupthink in the, the, that I wrote about in the book. Festinger argued that the brain likes to feel comfortable with one belief. And if a new belief challenges that, subconsciously, we try to dismiss it or reframe the new information. So the lazy belief we already hold doesn't have to move its position and leave the brain. For example, let's say you smoke. And a new study says that smoking uh, causes cancer and death. You'll say, well, uh, they smoked differently in that study than how I smoke. I'm going to live long because I started smoking later than in that study. You'll find a way. They'll make stuff up to reframe new information so they won't have to dismiss what they already believe. And that is a human tendency that we all have. And recognizing that tendency is really the guide to impeccable objectivity. And when you've got impeccable objectivity, you're more affable, you're more successful, and you're more likely to make a discovery in science. I think you bring up such an interesting point because our brain is automatically trained to try and be like as efficient as possible. And so we're really good at making all of these snap judgments. And a lot of times like we do it and it can be really helpful, but we often have the tendency also to not analyze the way that we're thinking. And I noticed myself, even when we were talking about the whole Mayo Clinic microbiome antibiotic study, that as you were speaking, Marty, I was kind of like, oh, so you're saying antibiotics are bad. Because that's just that's simple. the easy, yeah, yeah, that's just the easiest thing for my brain to come to the conclusion right. of. And it's like, no, they're very helpful when used in the right situations. But you also have to analyze like whether the risks outweigh the benefits and you just have to continue to question it. And so I kind of had to like take a step back in my mind as we were talking about it of like, well, why am I getting defensive of this? Like, mm -hmm. what is it that's making me feel this way? But it takes a long time to try and train yourself to be able to do that in situations regularly. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be around people also that are willing to do that and willing to, you know, call you out, but not necessarily in a negative way, but just to have civil discussions about yeah, things and entertain and encourage the people. ideas exactly yeah. just encourage each other to think about things critically and i think that that helps a lot I, you know Absolutely. when i when i was reading some of these stories i kept I, I kept thinking about another problem which is logic is an organized way of going wrong and i think i felt like a lot of these ideas that we you know that, that that medicine has seems logical from a from an initial standpoint but then ultimately prove to be incorrect well he says the point is that like you can't do research without the basis the foundation of plausibility right so like there has to be some kind of like mechanism or, or concept behind why you're studying the thing that you're studying right but you can't stop there either right like it makes perfect sense for example that tamiflu might help with uh, influenza infection, right? Because of the, the biomechanism of the medicine that uh, we think this is something that could, could work. We can't stop there. Now we have to go study and actually show that it, there, is, there is evidence, right? Yeah. Well, We've, I mean, it's you know, talking about you know, the, the, uh, the, the uh, advice that medicine gave to patients about diet. And it seems to make sense that you know, eating a lot of fat would make you fat. I mean, that's logical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turns out to be wrong. Now go study it. Yeah. You can't <laughs> yeah. stop on that. that makes sense. And there's right? a lot of nuance that goes between like the research study and how it's actually communicated to the public because there's data that exists and the community 
as a whole is not going to interpret it the same way that doctors do. Like, for example, when COVID pandemic was going on and it was spreading on the news that hydroxychloroquine was helpful against COVID. So and that it's just a malarial drug or anti-malarial drug. So me as a medical assistant at the rheumatology clinic, when all of our rheumatoid arthritis patients are taking hydroxychloroquine, can no longer take it are having medication shortages because people are stealing this medication or hoarding it. And then there's like, I heard of an elderly couple that found hydrochloroquine in their fish tank cleaner and poisoned themselves. Oh yeah. Yeah. I remember there's that. like so much room for like misinterpretation and like whether or not it's a good idea to share certain, like certain aspects that we learn. Well, part of that goes down to like our, just our public education system in general. Like, mm-hmm. A lot of the studies that get put out by people in medicals and medical schools and stuff like don't actually get read by the public in the first place, right? Like mm-hmm. they're not really even in accessible areas for the public. And so one person gets a hold of them and then it's that person's interpretation of that mm-hmm. of that study that gets out. Um, oh, I, I want I kind of to I have to push back a little bit because I don't think that it's that the public isn't educated. I think like we've talked about, doctors are lazy. The public is even just as lazy as doctors are, right? They well, also want the non-nuanced, just give it to me straight doc, like cholesterol bad. That was that was such an easy marketing campaign because it's simple, right? Like fat bad, we're, we're done, right? There's no nuance that we don't have to have a discussion. I, as the lazy guy that just is trying to exist in my day to day, that works, right? I get the value of that. And and if my job is to try to take some nuanced science and, and communicate it to the public, I recognize the danger of the power that I have if I'm the head of one of these organizations and I can just say something like, well, fat's bad or HRT bad, right? Instead of having a, a nuanced conversation with, with the public, that, that's the problem. Well, and I don't I think it's it. always inherently like devious either. Oh, you no, know, I mean, it is, it's it, just because it's easier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's well-meaning, but yeah. there's also needing to consider how are people going to interpret mm-hmm. what doctors interpret because yeah. the interpretation comes from like doctor to patient ideally aside from the news story. Right. So for certain situations, you also need to consider like, what are they going to change because of the information you give them? Like if they are, for example, like not on an American diet or like a standard American diet, like for example, I don't, I'm not familiar with a lot of American meals or vegetables. So when I'm told something like, oh yeah, something about beans. Well, I never eat beans, so that doesn't apply to me. Yeah. Or someone who okay. has gout, they can't have like soy or something. And soy is like a huge a part huge of the diet. A huge staple of the... Uh, yeah. So what is the diet going to become after they take out the soy? It's just... Rice. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I love what you're saying, Julie and Fallon. We can't just have verbal diarrhea out there and confuse the public. They're already confused. And on 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 the other extreme, we can't censor the message that the public hears such that reasonable people who disagree with the low-fat recommendation, they were totally censored. During the HIV outbreak, many doctors, and I I chronicle this in the book, actually, one of the stories you may remember, they said, you cannot question the safety of blood transfusions. You'll question, people will start to question the entire institution of blood banking, the the life-saving power of blood transfusions. Meanwhile, we know the entire blood supply was laced with HIV. We killed a generation of patients with severe hemophilia. You didn't even see them in the hospital. And that was all for like, it took like six years after doctors were saying, hey, HIV is in the blood supply. It's got these people who we diagnose in the AIDS clinic are going to donate blood because they used to, they would pay people to donate blood and plasma. And so there was such a, this, this intense protection of the brand and the institution and the message. And we have to be sure. And we did a lot of damage. And I experienced it a little bit during COVID. My research team, you may know at Johns Hopkins, did the largest human study on natural immunity long term. We took people who had COVID but hadn't been vaccinated, hundreds of them, and tested their blood, looking for the antibody, the levels, the duration. And we published this in JAMA, the big JAMA, not the side JAMA journals. It was one of the most widely read articles of the year on the JAMA website. And when I would talk to public health officials, the big boys who are making all the decisions, they said, yeah, we don't want to acknowledge natural immunity's protective value because some people might interpret that as then we don't need a vaccine. 
And I'm, where I'm thinking, what is going on here? They're talking, they're treating the American people like they're stupid. It's the old medical paternalism we saw when doctors tried to block home pregnancy tests because they thought women can't handle the information. And um, you can both be honest about the data being discussed among experts and encourage vaccination at the same time. You can do both. You don't have to dumb it down in such a way. So our study got censored. We believed there was gain-of-function research in the Wuhan lab. Google was very open. We They censored all of the, those posts and searches. And so the, when you do that, we're not in a healthy place in science. And I think the purpose of science is to challenge deeply held assumptions in the field. So you're saying that the better way to do it would be to be honest with people about what you know and what you don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, David, because we have a mistrust crisis right now. I don't know if you saw the study that just came out. 60% of the public does not have high trust in the medical profession. I mean, that's epidemic. People are not going to get their childhood vaccines. They're not going to come in when they're uh, vomiting or sick. I mean, we have a public trust crisis. And I think when you lie to the public that, oh, we just have to make the message simple, and then the truth comes out, you end up uh, violating one of our sacred uh, covenants with the public, and that is to always be honest. Look, I remember I made a mistake once. I ordered a CAT scan and it got done on the wrong patient because they had a similar name. When I found out, I went to the patient who got the CAT scan unnecessarily. I said, look, you got a CAT scan you didn't need. It was a mistake. I don't know what happened, but I take responsibility. I'll go down and check the results right now for you if you want. I don't know what it shows. I just found out. And that guy was already a little sort of disgruntled before all this happened. And he wasn't angry. He looked at me with a smile. And he says, thank you, doctor, for coming up here and sharing that with me. I really appreciate it. People are hungry for honesty, and they can be very forgiving if we're transparent and honest along the way, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking back to, you know, the, the sort of early days of COVID when, you know, nobody knew what the hell was going on and we were getting all this advice. And, and you know, I was very much on board with a lot of the very restrictive things that Mm -hmm. that people were doing. These days, I feel like, yeah, it would have been a lot better if people, if, you know, we were just open and honest about what we knew, what we didn't know. We'd be saying, you know, we don't know if, you know, masking is going to help. It seems logical that it will. So we recommend that you mask. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I just, I kept thinking about that as I, you know, read your book. And, and I love what Alex said. You know, Alex just said, when you hear about the antibiotics carpet bombing the microbiome and leading these chronic diseases, you want to just, our brain naturally subconsciously goes to, okay, well then they're evil. No, antibiotics save lives, right? C-sections save lives. That's the point that I love that Alex just made is that it's a nuanced conversation. And that's what separates us from the natural tendency of this cognitive dissonance. And you see this in politics all the time. Oh, uh, there's a war in the world. Okay, tell me who's good and bad. Yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. and then it's just all. Oh, let's just go in on. Well, maybe it's complicated, right? Maybe it's maybe it's not what you're hearing, and it's there's more nuance to it. And that's I think our uh, charge as health professionals is to provide that nuance to people and individualized care. And when we don't know, it's okay to say we don't know. It's probably the right answer during COVID a lot of times. Yeah, and probably I mean I don't know personally. I would really, really like to get to a place in our profession where we could get get away from some of these internal politics, right? Not like red versus blue kind of stuff, but you know, like we said, like does it have to be that you're either HRT is evil or or HIT, HRT is gonna I don't know, it's, it's a miracle world, drug, yeah. right? Like is 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 kale the the wonder food or is it is it bad, right? Or, or or are we gonna only study this one type of subject or this other kind of subject? You know, like do we have the the humility, the the epistemic humility to to say we don't know. Therefore, I, I mean, one of the ideas I don't I think it was in your book, this idea that like what if we just took people that are really smart, they've studied a lot in their field, and we just said here's some money. I don't care what you study, just just go nuts yeah. because that's we're not going to get there if there are arbiters deciding what what are the things that we can study. If there's a political agenda behind what subjects get funding. Mm -hmm. Medicine has only ever improved on the ideas that we don't know are coming, right? Like 
no, three days before Fleming looked at his Petri dish, nobody had any idea that penicillin was coming around the corner, right? Like that just wasn't a thing. If you had asked me 10 years ago, if we were going to have a gene therapy for sickle cell, I'd be like, well, I don't, I don't think so. Right. Like that's, there's one of those big breakthroughs that, that only happens because we're not forcing people to only study certain things. Right. We, we got to have a little bit more humility in saying, I don't know, go, go study everything. Well, I feel like Dr. McCary might have other things to do today, but I'm, Fun. I'm so <laughs> glad you, uh, you came on the show again. Thanks for, thanks so much for coming to talk with us about your new book. Oh yeah. Um, no, thank you for reading it and taking an interest in it. When, I'm really excited about it. So I think it comes out in mid September. Is that right? Yeah. It's now available wherever, uh, oh, okay. wherever books are sold. So go get your copy of blind spots when medicine gets it wrong and what it means for our health, wherever you get your books. It's a really accessible read and I learned a lot. And, and th again, thanks for coming on the show. Awesome. Great to see you guys. Great conversation. Thanks so much. Yep. Jeff, okay, thanks yeah, for tomorrow. putting this together for us. And thank you, Fallon, Julie, and Alex for being a part of it. It was an honor. Yeah. Let me know thank when you. there's the, the paperback, the hardcover audiobook, the Netflix documentary. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and what kind of blind spot would I have if I forgot to thank you, Short Coats, for making us part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever fine podcasts are available. Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government and ongoing support from the Writing and Humanities program. Our music is by Dr. Vox and Catmosphere. I'm Dave Etler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look. Life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult, and I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need and so i'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use but the bottom line is that for what it's worth i see you i know you're out there i wish i could do more maybe i can in ways that i don't understand yet or know about but i see you and i'm glad you're here and other people are too This Short Code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.